Record. All right. Hello, uh, everyone, and welcome to the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site's fourth Tuesday speaker night. My name is Lenora Henson. I am the deputy director curator here at the TR site, and I'm joined behind the scenes one last time by Travis Ratka, the TR site's uh, programming assistant. As you may know, uh, the TR site is continuing to celebrate its 50th anniversary this year. We are proud to be Western New York's only national park site, although we're actually managed on a daily basis by a local foundation that is also responsible for raising nearly $500,000 each year to keep our doors open. In that vein, I want to say a special thank you to all of the TR site members who are with us today. Your support is always appreciated, um, but uh, even more so these days as you know, everything is changing still on a daily basis. Uh, Travis, do you have the link that you could drop in the chat in the chat or, or do you have that or not? Okay, um, Travis is going to drop a chat uh, link into the chat if anybody uh, joining us online wants to learn more about TR membership. Uh, I would be remiss, however, if I didn't also acknowledge and appreciate the generous financial support of our series sponsors, the New York State Council on the Arts, as well as our numerous answers. Uh, annual sponsors who uh, are, should be on your screen. We couldn't bring you this sort of programming without them. And I'm also going to, you know, assume, I probably should have assumed already, but uh, if people are having trouble, if, if our online audience is having trouble seeing or hearing, please uh, chat to either Travis or I, we'll, we'll see what we can do on that. The Theodore Roosevelt's inaugural site's uh, monthly speaker night series is our opportunity on the fourth Tuesdays of most months to invite experts to help us think more deeply about Theodore Roosevelt, as well as some of the issues that were important during his presidency and continue to be relevant today. In case you're new to our speaker night series, I should also mention that uh, NISCA's support has enabled us to record nearly all of our speakers for the past I think it's four or five, maybe even six years, I've lost track. Um, but if you've missed any of them, check out our YouTube page and I'm gonna have ask Travis to drop that link in the chat as well. Um, with that out of the way, I'm going to try and stop that screen, bring us back to this screen. Um, and I am thrilled to be introducing tonight's speaker. <laughs> joining, us, joining us from the University of Roehampton in London is historian and author, Dr. Michael Patrick Cullinane. Um, thank you again for joining us. Dr. Cullinane was born and raised in New Jersey before he moved to Ireland and graduated from University College Cork, National University of Ireland, with an MA and PhD in history. He's taught diplomatic history as well as United States history at University College Cork, the University of, uh, I'm gonna, is it Leicester? Leicester, yeah. yeah. All right, um, and Northumbria University. He's taught at the University of Roehampton since 2017. While much of Dr. Colony's research explores the foreign policies of the United States during the early 20th century, his 2017 book was called Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, The History and Memory of an American Icon. It was the first comprehensive examination of Roosevelt's legacy, and it traces the shifts and changes that TR's reputation has endured since his death in, 19, in 1919. It was awarded the Theodore Roosevelt Association's Book Prize. He's here today, however, to talk about his most recent TR-related book. Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, Reminiscences of His Contemporaries was published just last year and draws on a remarkable set of oral histories and never before published transcripts from the 1950s. Um, I truly love the way this book came about and I don't wanna spoil it for anyone. So I will turn things over to Dr. Cullinane momentarily. First, one last reminder to our online audience, please feel free to submit your questions at any point uh, using either the chat or the Q&A function. I'll be back to facilitate our Q&A with Dr. Cullinane after he finishes his remarks. And with that, uh, Dr. Colony, are you set with your present, your screen share and all of that? Or do yeah, you need us? And then I'll share my screen if that's okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you thank so much for having me, Laura. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks to Travis for the work behind the scenes. 
And thanks everyone who's watching on site and uh, and online. I'm so sorry that I was late. It's really out of character for me. Um, my diary is all over the place with the time zone differences. Um, today, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about my new book, as Lenora said, and I'll just share my screen here. This is um, uh, a rather infamous statue now that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, it's the one that was formerly outside the American Museum of Natural History that we've been talking about for the last couple of years, and it's been uh, removed and uh, and I suppose being considered about where to place it and how to curate it. Um, it seems like memorials have never been more important, and that's great for me because I've got a an, an expertise in it and a real passion for understanding how they connect the past with the future. That's something that uh, is is quite close to my heart, uh, and as a scholar, but also as you know a, a fellow human being. I believe that. We are actively, um, right now even, in the process of reshaping uh, the past with, you know, through, through our, our present understanding of the past. And, and, and Lenora introduced the book, so I don't have to do so much heavy lifting, but in 2017, I published Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, which was all about uh, Theodore Roosevelt's legacy. What had happened, I knew that I wanted to study more about Roosevelt, but I had found out that there were like, I don't know, 400 biographies, maybe more. So uh, I, my, my opportunity really lied in the posthumous years, the century after he died in 1919. And I was determined to look at any relevant cultural output. And that meant things like films, which was great fun having, you know, getting to watch uh, tens of, uh, of films with Theodore Roosevelt in almost a hundred films, uh, looking at all sorts of pop cultural references, everything from the Simpsons to, uh, ephemera and postcards to statues like the 16 foot statue you see there on the right of Theodore Roosevelt and that's the National Memorial uh, in Theodore Roosevelt at Theodore Roosevelt Island. Um, but there are many statues um, all over the country and elsewhere in the world. Um, the research was a decade long and it was um, it was it was intended to be as comprehensive as possible but trying to squeeze a, a decade of research, into a roughly 300 page book uh, was, was pretty difficult. And so I had a lot of leftover material. Uh, some of it was a lot of fun and I wish I could share all of that with you. Um, I, I looked at commercial advertising as well, which never really made it into the book. And I wrote an article about that. Uh, everything from the Roosevelt car to uh, the way he's been presented in uh, 2015 integrated campaign for Cadillac. Uh, using the Dare Greatly slogan and his Man in the Arena speech. Um, naturally, statues have been very popular uh, and pop culture references, uh, they abound. But there was one part of the, the, the legacy project that I hadn't had a chance to really um, get into greater detail in the, in the book that I thought was incredibly important, and that was the oral history project. And, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that project now. So uh, some of you, I suspect, will have heard the name Herman Hagedorn before. Um, that's him pictured here. I know it's not a great photo, but um, Hagedorn was the, uh, that's him pictured there, if you can see my mouse uh, moving. Hagedorn was the director of the Roosevelt Memorial Association. And in 1919, there was actually two memorial associations. There was a women's association and a men's association. And Hagedorn became the director of the men's association. But he had very close links to the Women's Association. And when they finally amalgamate in the 1950s, Hagedorn is going to take over as the, the, the co-leader. Uh, but in 1919, when he, uh, he, he had met Roosevelt in 1916, they become fast friends over World War I, preparedness, and anti-communism, really. Uh, Hagedorn was a, a writer, a journalist, and a literary mind. And Roosevelt and him became quite close during those years. After he dies, Hagedorn deter is determined to collect everything that he can uh, that's Roosevelt related. So uh, we owe the uh, collection of film at the, the Library of Congress to Hagedorn. We owe a lot of the collections of letters that were, were gathered in the years after Roosevelt's death to Hagedorn as well. He collected a huge library uh, that has now been distributed in, in really in many sites all over, all over the country. But when he started, the thing that was most important to him were oral histories. He wanted to collect accounts from Roosevelt's friends and family. 
And the plans began in 1919 for him to collect mainly stories from around Long Island and, and mainly about Sagamore Hill, which is the site that he was most interested in his whole life. And Hagedorn wanted to reach, well, he began reaching out to people like Edith Roosevelt and some local friends, and they, they simply weren't interested. First of all, they didn't know who Hagedorn was. He was a sort of a new kid on the block. And then also they were wary of the technology that he wanted to use. He, he was trying to create a film about Sagamore Hill, and so the project never came off. Instead, Hagedorn went to the Badlands in North Dakota, uh, made a film out there, and, and interviewed uh, some people that Roosevelt had known during his ranching time out there, and, uh, and, and, that, and that was the project. He produced a biography of Roosevelt in the Badlands instead of a biography about Roosevelt in Long Island. The idea of oral histories kicked off again in the 1950s, and that, that timing is important. In the 1940s, oral history became a little bit more professionalized through a New Deal program um, uh, that, that allowed uh, testimony uh, about all sorts of American history to, to, to be recorded, things like the Chicago fire and slavery. And it was a, a, the, the Public Works Administration was working on gathering these stories and writers were doing that. And by the 1950s, Alan Nevins, who was a professor at Columbia University, started the first oral history center at, at, at Columbia. And Nevins and Hagedorn knew each other. In fact, there's some wonderful correspondence between the two of them. And they decided that they were going to interview Roosevelt's contemporaries that were still alive and that were still able to give accounts of their time with Roosevelt. And so they did that and Hagedorn enlisted his daughter. And if you can see this red circle down here, I, that's the only photo I, I have of Mary Hagedorn. I can't find another one, or I haven't found one yet, but he enlisted Mary Hagedorn, his daughter, to do a lot of the interviews, and uh, Mary also joined Alan Nevins as a master's student in the, uh, the, the oral history program at Columbia. All of this dovetailed with the uh, TR Centennial, which was the anniversary of his uh, 100th birthday, and it was a, a major celebration and the interviews became a major part of refashioning the, the idea of Theodore Roosevelt in popular memory. Now, in terms of the archival find, um, this was a this was a like a, every historian's dream, I think, is finding uh, finding material that you you just didn't know was out there. And I had, I had known that the oral history collection was out there because there were transcripts at Columbia University. These had already been seen and had already been published. But in 2018, I got in touch uh, with uh, Susan Sarna, who was the curator at uh, Sagamore Hill National Park site. She's no longer there. She's in Long Island still. I think she's at Fire Island site. But she knew a lot about the collections in the area, uh, having been a longtime curator there. And uh, she told me that there was more transcripts that were coming to Sagamore Hill from the Manhattan birthplace and that I should check them out. And I, I did, and I found that there were transcripts there that I don't think is, a lot of people had seen before. They were certainly unpublished, but they included uh, accounts from people like Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, as well as the other Eleanor Roosevelt, who was Ted's wife and uh, TR's daughter-in-law, uh, TR's sister, uh, or, or TR's daughter, uh, Ethel, inc was included in that as well. So these were sort of rare, but then there was a number of recordings that uh, we, we talked about that were held still in the birthplace and that were staying there. And these were never heard, or at least to my knowledge, were never heard. And I say to my knowledge because I, I don't know, maybe someone did listen to them, but I've, I've done my due diligence. I've asked um, leading historians who have spent time in that archive particularly, and they said that they haven't heard them. And I, I've asked um, National Park Service rangers dating all the way back to the 1970s if they ever heard the tapes or if they ever gave anyone access to the tapes, and they haven't. So these are really a new, a, a new find, I think, uh, you know, just with that caveat. You never want to be too sure about these things. Someone will come out and say, actually, I heard them in whatever, 1980. But as far as I know, no one's heard them. And there's probably good reason to assume that that's, uh, that's a fair assumption. These uh, are seven inch reel to reel tapes. They look something like this picture here, although that is not the actual uh, recording. They were, the recordings were taken between 1954 and 1955. And the, the question about why I think they're unheard. Um, well, first of all, these tapes 
pretty much by the 1960s were an obsolete technology. And what I mean by that is that when the National Park Service took over from the, uh, uh, from the Roosevelt Memorial Association, when they transferred the property from uh, the, the, the Memorial Association to the National Park site, it was 1963. And by that stage, uh, cassettes, tape cassettes, had really replaced reel-to-reel -reel magnetic film to record with. And when I reached out to Danny Prebut, who's the curator of the Manhattan sites now, uh, he said to me, if you want to listen to these recordings, you're going to have to, um, you're, you're going to have to come in with your own reel-to-reel -reel recorder because we don't have one. And talking to other National Park Service rangers, in the late 1970s, they didn't have recorders in the house either. Uh, so it's unlikely that these were being listened to and that they were stashed away in a safe in a, in a back room. The other thing that makes me think that they weren't listened to is that a lot of the material on the tapes were uncatalogued. And what I mean by that is that you'll find a, a guide to what's, what's in the archives. And the guide that I was presented with, with these reels was, uh, it was, it was erroneous, it was wrong. There was a number of um, people that were listed as speaking on the tapes that were not on the tapes. Um, and, and the archivists had said that they, they, hadn't, they hadn't really done a, a good job in putting, putting together the, um, the, the catalog from the early days in the 1960s, but it was clear that this had been something that it was you know, neglected for a number of years and locked away in that safe. So what did I find? Well, there's a number of people speaking on the tape some of them you'll know, some of them may, may be new names to you. I'm sure Alice Roosevelt Longworth is, is not a new name to anyone. Um, she speaks for around two and a half hours uh, and, and, and over a number of days, I think three different interview days, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she's, she's got some really wonderful testimony about, uh, about a number of things, life in Sagamore Hill, politics in the 1950s, which I'll mention later on. Uh, there's also William Sheffield Coles, which is pictured, he's pictured down here. That is he is the son of uh, uh, Bammy or uh, Anna Roosevelt Coles and the nephew of Theodore Roosevelt. There's also Corrine Roosevelt Alsop, which is the daughter of Corrine Roosevelt Robinson and TR's niece. Uh, this is uh, pictured here, Georgiana Farr Sibley, better known as Mrs. Harper Sibley, as she liked to be called. Her husband was Harper Sibley. Um, she was a neighbor of the Robinsons in Orange, New Jersey, and she spent a lot of time at Sagamore Hill with TR's daughter, Ethel Roosevelt. Uh, and then there's also people like William Savakul, who was a progressive party politician uh, for, uh, for a few years and was a political acolyte. So there's, there's family, there's friends, there's neighbors, and there are the, these sort of politically connected people and, uh, and they give a really varied testimony about, about TR, as well as about a number of other things, which I'll mention. But first on TR, um, I think what we get from the oral histories is a sense of humanity that we don't always get, especially from the sort of great man biographies. Um, uh, you know, TR obviously has that, that role to play in American history, but what you get from these recordings is a little bit more uh, human. You know, as a friend and as a father, and I think particularly as a father, he comes off as being really quite soft. Um, as a friend, he comes off as being quite soft. Some of my favorite stories in the oral histories, though, are when, uh, well, he just doesn't scold his kids, and his kids should be scolded, I would have thought, in some cases. Like, for example, when they eat, uh, eat through the pantry on a, on a holiday weekend in, in Washington and, and TR, the president, can't replace uh, the, the, the food for, you know, invited guests that are, that are due to arrive. Uh, instead of scolding his kids, he, he laughs with them. And Edith uh, castigates him for that, saying, you know, you really should be uh, giving out to the kids for being so uh, naughty. Uh, so there's that degree of humanity. I think the, you know, we've, we've probably all heard about TR being um, a, a, a very warm father, but what these testimonies uh, tell us is, is the extent to which he really was um, uh, in love with his children and believed in them faithfully and, uh, and, and aimed to just be around them, um, which I think speaks very much to, to his humanity. In terms of Humility, there's a couple of interesting uh, stories, um, but um, one of my favorites is when uh, Edith uh, gives him trouble for spilling pot roast juices all over his, 
his white starch shirt and um and he says you know i'm you know i'm just a simple man and i i you know even if the senators are coming i don't really care to change my shirt i'm quite comfortable you know at, at sagamore hill and that that to me is an interesting story that says something that um i, I suppose it speaks to um a, a, another part of roosevelt that isn't the statesman but is the the, the human and there's quite a bit of uh, funny stories in here as well. Um, when Georgiana Farr Sibley comes to meet Roosevelt and says, I'm getting married to Harper Sibley, he asks, does Harper know? Because Harper had been asking Georgiana for years. And Roosevelt's wit seems to be in these stories, uh, especially sharp and, and, and quick. Um, there's a number of stories about Roosevelt doing family opera or, or being quick-witted quick amongst uh, good company. And the hospitality that he he gives at Sagamore is evident as well, whether it's, you know, being chivalrous to guests or uh, or or just, you know, putting on a good uh, a good party for for invited guests. The stories that came out in every single account uh, or nearly every single account was about TR's memory. And that, to me, was one of the most startling things, because none of these um, None of these interviews with friends and family and, and, and political friends too, none of them were uh, um, collaborations. In other words, um, William Savakul, a political friend, didn't know that he was also in, you know, that Hagedorn was also interviewing Judge McCook. You know, these were completely um, separate interviews held over, you know, an, a couple of years. And yet the stories remained incredibly similar, especially on this memory issue. And two of the stories that I thought were the most interesting to tell were about when TR uh, spotted a, sail a sailor and a sergeant uh, and recognized them uh, relatively quickly after seeing them. The story about the sailor is that when he was greeting a flotilla of uh, vessels, one of the large boats had something like 500 or 600 sailors on it, and they were all presenting to the president in formal uh, sailors uh, uh, uniforms. And he spotted one on a, a gun turret and said, I'd like to see that, that man down here, please. And, uh, and he said, you know, aren't you so-and-so that presented to me and my wife a, a loving cup, you know, two or three years ago? And the, the sailor said, yes, I, you know, I am. And that story was interesting to me because the sailor then went off to the rest of the crew and told that story. And the sort of myth and legend of Roosevelt, you know, got bigger that day. And that's how he operated in a lot of ways. And the sergeant is a more intimate story, but nevertheless impressive. When he met a police sergeant in New York City when he was president, the, the police sergeant was on detail that night and he was riding along Roosevelt in the car, on the side of the car, and Roosevelt turned to him and recognized him and said, aren't you Sergeant so-and-so? And the man said, yes. And he said, um, well, I made you a sergeant, sergeant didn't I? Why didn't, you, why didn't you address me? And he said, sir, I'm sorry, I didn't think you'd remember me. But again, this is the, the power of TR's memory, which is a force, it seems, all of its own. There's also a number of stories, and I know in the audience, I saw, I saw some of the participants that Brenda Cherry is here. Uh, there's also a lot on Sagamore Hill. Brenda is one of the friends of Sagamore Hill. And uh, I know she's uh, had, a, had a look at the book, and I hope she's had an opportunity to listen to some of the stories. There's quite a bit on the meetings and the dinings in Sagamore Hill, whether it's the food that they ate or the games that they played, it gives a really vibrant uh, um, impression of what it was like to be at the Summer White House or even in later years. And there's quite a bit on the outdoors as well. Like for example, Alice talks, Alice Roosevelt Longworth talks about uh, the orchards and how she would play sort of king of the orchard. And the other kids have, uh, particularly Kermit has some uh, rather exciting hijinks, almost lighting a neighbor's house on fire. So you get a sense of a very lively environment for the children and the Roosevelt family. And there's also quite a bit around the White House. I'd love to go into more detail about this uh, if we have time in the questions. Everything from you know putting out cigarette butts in, in, in executive bedrooms uh, or, or bedrooms upstairs in the White House to playing tennis on, on the tennis court uh, where the Oval Office is today. Now, the other thing I would say is that there's quite a bit on the Roosevelt family itself, which is great because I think it changes our minds about some of the things that we've thought over the years about the Roosevelt family. 
And I mean this both about the Oyster Bay clan and upstate Hyde Park clan, particularly in terms of some of the black sheep that we've come to uh, think, or we, we've come to think about some of them as black sheep. So uh, I'll just pull a book off here. This is a, a recent book called The War of the Roosevelt's by William Mann, which presents Elliot Roosevelt as an alcoholic and a drug addict, which he was. Uh, but also uh, presents Theodore Roosevelt as someone who, uh, I guess, effectively pushed his brother aside in order to make a political career for himself. And what the oral histories tell us is that people in the family believed that Elliot had epilepsy and that uh, instead of pushing him away and pushing him out of the picture, uh, what they were trying to do is to help him grapple with his disease uh, at, at times, and it doesn't work. I mean, we, we know the sad story of Elliot that uh, that alcohol and drug addiction, you know, really overtake him throughout much of his life. But it does give us a different sense of how the family dealt with it. For example, he doesn't go to Harvard like his older brother Theodore, because likely because of the epilepsy, or at least that's what the family, that's the story that they're telling in these these testimonies. And there's another uh, story about another black sheep who is uh, uh, Tad or James Roosevelt. He's Franklin Roosevelt's uh, half brother. He uh, married a prostitute or at least uh, believed to be prostitute and uh, was disowned by his father, uh, James Rosie Roosevelt. Um, if this isn't getting confusing all the names, uh, there, there's a lot of this, the, the same names, but Tad uh, was, uh, was kind of pushed away by the family, or at least that's how the story goes. In fact, what the oral histories prove is that Tad kept a very close relationship with his sister, Helen, who was bo both an Oyster Bay by marriage and a Hyde Park Roosevelt by birth. Uh, and, and in fact, he was just a, a recluse. Um, he uh, lived a very quiet life in Florida and donated all of his money uh, to the Salvation Army when he passed away. So these black sheep turn out to be slightly different characters, at least in the uh, in the minds of the Roosevelt family and their retelling of family stories. There is quite a bit on infidelities you'll find here. Um, the, I mean, some of them are you know quite remarkable. I'll I'll play you a uh, a short clip of uh, a story about Nick Nick Longworth, uh, Alice Longworth's uh, husband and the the former Speaker of the House. Uh, uh, there are also stories about Theodore R Robinson, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, about in some infidelities and, and mainly uh, liaisons with, with prostitutes. I mean, some of it's quite dark, and it seems that the family is at times reluctant to tell these stories, but also they've been aired. And I think that in some cases, these are re-airings of those stories as well. Alcoholism plays a major theme in some of the family history as does the role of women. What comes through in this book, I, I hope anyway, is that the Roosevelt women are probably far more foundational and they, their longevity means that they play a greater role, not only in the family, but in the story of the American experience. I know Betty Boyd Caroli's book does great justice to uh, the Roosevelt women and other authors have done a wonderful job showing this as well. But what you can see, even in the dialogue, um, a lot of the Roosevelt women are retelling these stories and not only keeping uh, the legacy of some of the family members alive, but ensuring that they're told in accurate ways. Um, so my hope is, is that the book does, you know, does a service to the, the Roosevelt women because uh, I, I think that they are in some cases more important and in some cases more interesting than the Roosevelt men. So some of the new transcripts, I think I've already mentioned these are from Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, Eleanor Butler Roosevelt, that's Theodore Roosevelt Jr.'s wife, and Ethel Roosevelt from Oyster Bay. There's also a really fun story from Augusta Munn Tilney, who's a neighbor of the Robinsons, about a spooky story that Corrine Roosevelt Robinson told about meeting her brother Elliot. Uh, and again, these are all available on the tapes. I won't be able to share all that with you, but uh, if there are any questions about that, I'd be more than delighted to, uh, to go into more detail about any of these stories. And there's also some really exciting transcripts from people like Jesse Langdon, who is better known as the last Rough Rider. He is, um, well, as he would say himself in his testimony, he was the first to enlist or the first to be sworn in 
and the last one to leave the Rough Riders, both by accident. But either way, he outlives all of the Rough Riders as well into his 90s. And his testimony is actually the last account uh, that's collected by the uh, Columbia University Oral History Collection. Um, Jesse Langdon's is remarkable for so many reasons. It gives us such a flavor of what life was like in the 1890s uh, in the United States, in Cuba, in the Philippines, touring with um, uh, Buffalo Bill and the, wi the Wild West shows. I mean, he's really a remarkable personality. Barkley Farr is interviewed. Um, he is a friend of Kermit Roosevelt's and his is, his is my most, uh, I, I, my favorite testimony comes from Barkley Farr. He talks about playing tennis with Theodore Roosevelt. He talks about hijinks with Kermit Roosevelt. He talks about inviting uh, the Progressive Party candidate TR to Princeton University in 1912, uh, uh, which of course was Woodrow Wilson's uh, turf. Um, so that's a wonderful one. There's also stories from Stanley Isaacs, who's a New York City politician, all the way into the 1960s. From Helen Roosevelt Robinson, pictured here, as I said, Helen Roosevelt Robinson was a Roosevelt by birth, Hyde Park, and then she married uh, Theodore Robinson, who was a Oyster Bay Roosevelt. And her stories really are great in telling us the, the sort of um, the differences between the two clans and also where the uh, congruities are. Um, there's quite a bit on Franklin and Eleanor in almost all of these stories as well, uh, because of course, in the 1950s, the legacy of Franklin looms quite large. And the context is always key, I think, in understanding any of these, um, any of these uh, uh, testimonies. So in the 1950s, generally, I think TR's legacy is on the rise. And there's a number of reasons that I lay out in the book, Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, why I think TR's legacy is on the rise during these years. The other thing I would say is that communism looms particularly large. This is the tail end of McCarthyism, 1944, 1945. Even Alice Roosevelt Longworth talks about meeting Joe McCarthy and, uh, and also talks about how he sort of lost popularity and lost the run of himself uh, in, in, in a number of ways by 1955. So that's interesting. But all of this is still um, a really important context to understand how people are thinking about Theodore Roosevelt. So for Mrs. Longworth, for example, she talks about the League of Nations as a, it being a, um, a distant cousin to the United Nations, different, but too similar for her liking. She, was, uh, uh, she didn't believe in the League or the UN as uh, organ international organizations that were able to fight off aggressor states. And her example is China and Formosa in the 1950s, which she believes that eventually China is going to invade what is now Taiwan or uh, and of course, it seems quite prescient maybe now, but uh, in the 1950s, that didn't happen. The other thing I would say about this is that everyone seems to be talking about what TR would have done if he had been president during World War I and that there wouldn't have been uh, a, a Soviet Union if that happened. And that's a really interesting um, counterfactual that we can, we can talk about, but that's in the minds of many of the political acolytes and it's in the mind of uh, Mrs. Longworth as well. One of the funniest stories she tells is about where you could meet communists in, in 1954 and 1955. And she says that dentist's office and doctor's office are the place where everyone's doing dead drops. And uh, there's a bit of sort of hysteria about the, uh, the context as well. So that is interesting for all those reasons. So why is the book and why are the oral histories important? Well, in short, I think they give us a new perspective. It's not a you know, complete reappraisal. I think the stuff that's been found is fascinating and is going to help us to add layers. But I mean, you know, Theodore Roosevelt as a historical character already has quite a few layers. So this is really about adding to that collage rather than uh, uh, peeling anything off of it. As I said, I think the book stresses the importance of the Roosevelt women, it lifts the legacy of those black sheep, and it remembers a human rather than a hero, which I think is so important when we uh, do any historical work that we work with a degree of empathy and the oral history allows us to do that. It's not a, a distant character from the far flung past. It's someone who is a family member of people that are talking to us and that we can, we can hear. 
And as I say, every new source adds some of these uh, dimensions. So I could talk quite a while longer about all this. I spent a lot of time writing the book and putting it all together, but I thought what would be much more fun would be is, is if I shared a short clip and I hope this works. Uh, I'm going to share a clip of uh, William Sheffield Coles and Margaret Kretsch Coles. They refer to themselves in the recording as Chef and Bobby. First, there's a clip that Bobby uh, is giving uh, a testimony about Eleanor Roosevelt and Sarah Delano Roosevelt. And then we'll move to a second clip where Chef enters and talks about his mother, Bammy, Eleanor, and Franklin. And then a final clip. Uh, about Nick Longworth and his marriage to Alice Longworth and the likelihood that her daughter's father is actually uh, Idaho Senator Bill Bora. Um, so let's just hope this works. If it doesn't, I hope uh, Lenora will, um, will let me know. And okay, let me just find YouTube. Bear with me. Can I just get a thumbs up from someone if they can see that? Thanks, Travis. But I think she, I think she wouldn't give them very much of a home life in one sense because she was so busy looking out there. Well, wasn't she, uh, Sarah Delano to Broadway? So that she never. That was a terrible relationship for Eleanor Long. Have a door to between their two houses in New York where Cousin Sally could come in any moment. That, that must have been a terrible. I didn't know that. She gave them their house and she had the house next door, and on one floor you could go from one house to the other. And then, of course, that summer was always spent in the high court in the house with Cousin Sally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not the point that he was 
Okay. Well, thank you very much for your patience at the start. And I hope this has uh, sparked a few questions uh, about, um, about the recordings, but also about TR, his family, his friends, and his political, uh, his political acolytes. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Uh, can you hear me, Michael? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think our screen for some reason up here for in-person audience is frozen, but the good news is that um, I think the, most of the slides came through and we could, we could hear parts of the uh, audio for that, that clip. Um, for our online audience, feel free to um, type in some questions or uh, in the chat box or the Q&A section. Uh, I do see one already. Uh, Michael Diane is wondering if these recordings have been curated by any of the TR organizations that have his papers and other things. So I assume like Harvard or Library of Congress or anything like that. Yeah, it's a great question. So in terms of curation, uh, the recordings themselves have not been curated. Uh, they, they have not been edited. So they were they were found. And when I found them, I, I they were at the Manhattan place, uh, the birthplace in Manhattan. So that is a national park site. Uh, and uh, it was with the help of Danny Prebit that I had them uh, um, digitized. So we, we skipped like, you know, three generations of audio formatting and we went um luckily there was a very uh, a, a very forward thinking and progressive uh person at, at the at the manhattan site who allowed us to digitize that stuff because i know the the assets that the national park service has they're really well protected and i mean that in a positive way um and the worry is always that they're going to get damaged but there was a a, a wonderful uh a chap about three blocks away who does, uh, um, he, he, tra he, he transfers, you know, old formats into new formats. And he did some cyber wizardry and cleaned up the audio so we can hear it. And you can probably hear that it's still a little bit uh, scratchy uh, and, and it's hard to hear in parts, but uh, that's the only curation that's been done. The other transcripts have been curated by the Hagedorns who have edited them uh, and also by some of the participants who have asked to have them edited as well. So it's a great question. All right, um, let's see. Trisha is wondering, uh, how did TR ever reconcile with Elliot or didn't he? Um, well, it's hard to say exactly, but I, uh, there's a number of letters that are in the papers of Anna Roosevelt Coles, TR's sister and Elliot's sister, about trying to um, put Elliot on the straight and narrow uh, including going to France and and trying to you know get him to return to the United States at times and also to you know uh, to 
give him family responsibilities at times to make him a little bit more, uh, well, to clean him up, basically. And that that obviously didn't work. And, and he met, a, a, you know, a, a not very pleasant end, uh, uh, you know, on Broadway. He, he I think he fell off the back of a carriage, which eventually did him in. And um, and so, yeah, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs about whether TR and Elliot reconciled at the end, but my my guess is is that because he hadn't cleaned up his act, they probably hadn't. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom uh, is wondering if you noticed any discrepancies between the transcripts and the tapes themselves, and maybe you yeah. can speak yeah. to that. Yeah, great question. Yeah, great question. Yes, definitely. Um, and in fact, there's some. On some of the recordings, uh, there are participants who say, I don't want that in the transcript. And there are participants who say, I want this sealed for many years. Um, there, you know, so the, uh, my suspicion is, and I can't verify this, but my suspicion is, is that the recordings were really only, um, they were only expected to be used to make the transcripts. I suspect that well, the, the Hagedorns definitely had this system. They edited the transcripts first from the audio, then they sent those transcripts to the participant for that person to edit them. And then they, they were sent back to the Hagedorns who would have one more go over them. So they were pretty heavily edited. What you get from the audio is the raw stuff. Uh, and you can tell that there's a difference between it. And you can tell that there are elements of it that uh, people just weren't comfortable saying something uh, on paper. So Kareen Roosevelt, all, uh, Robinson Alsop says on a number of occasions, some pretty terrible things about Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady. And uh, that probably wouldn't have appeared in the transcript, but does appear in the audio. Wow. Um, I have to confess that my uh, history nerd research person loves this kind of, <laughs> loves this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, how many hours of interviews were, did you find or did you go through? So there are seven reels. And again, this is, wasn't on the, the catalog, but there's two sides to those reels. So some of them though, don't have much on them. I mean, some might have seven minutes on one side and on the other side, it might have a full hour. I mean, it could hold one reel, could hold up to a, a, an hour on each side. Uh, none of them stretch to quite that, but there's, you know, between, 40 to 50 minutes on some of them. In total, I'm thinking it's probably in the range of about seven and a half hours. I did do the math at one stage. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but I did do the math and uh, did produce a full catalog sort of listing so that the National Park Service has it. And, and the audio is available. And I would encourage people to go uh, and ask for a, a re request uh, to, to access that. I've given full permission to the National Park site to make it public domain so that anyone can listen to that you know, whenever they like. Fantastic. And how many people were uh, interviewed? So seven and a half hours, how many people roughly? So, so on the recordings, there are 11, 11 people, 10 or 11. I'm not, I have to double check that now to be 100% sure. The book has a glossary of all this, by the way, so that you can see the dates when every interview is and you can see you know, who's a recording and who's just a transcript. There's uh, just over 20 in the entire collection and that includes um, testimony that's given as early as the late 40s and all the way into the 1970s. But all the recordings that we have left are from 1944, sorry, 1954 and uh, 1955. Okay, wow. Um, Stacy is wondering, and hello, Stacy. Um, Stacy is wondering if you have any information about a Roosevelt family opera was actually like. Well, it's that's in the recording. I have to go back and listen to that to to, to figure it out. Hi, Stacy. By the way, um, you know, Stacy is the expert on Mrs. Longworth, so she was one of the people that I turned to to say. I mean, not only did Stacy read the whole manuscript with an eagle eye, and I can't thank her enough for that. But uh, also, you know, I had to ask her, have you listened to these recordings? And she hadn't, so I sent them on to her. Um, I need to look up the opera again because uh, there's, there's, uh, there's more to do there to kind of put together. And this is why I'm glad that Brenda's here as well, because as a friend of Sagamore Hill, it would be great to recreate the atmosphere of one of those dinner parties and, uh, you know, to get a sense of what it was like to be in that house when it was so vibrant. Okay, um, let's see. Rachel 
has said, for the transcripts that were at Columbia and published, have any of them appeared in secondary works of TR before? Um, a related question, in addition to providing a more human side to TR, are you also hoping to see more integration of the oral histories with written materials in subsequent books about TR? So it's yes two parts. Yes. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So yes, the oral histories have been used. I'm sure, I'm sure Stacy has used some of the oral histories for, for her work. Um, I certainly use them for some of mine. And uh, I know just off the top of my head, Clay Risen has a book uh, uh, about the Rough Riders in Cuba that came out last year. And uh, he used Jesse Langdon's testimony. So they, they have been used, um, but none of the recordings have been obviously because they, they haven't been, you know, haven't been heard. Uh, do I hope that people will use them? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of work that can be done uh, with, with the stuff that's there. Yeah. All right. And um, let's see, one, another question. What in your opinion is uh, kind of the most shocking or most, uh, what was the thing that caught your attention most from the tapes? So they want the scandal. Um, I mean, <laughs> some of the stories we, we've heard already, you know, like for uh, uh, Paulina's um, uh, uh, parentage, you know, who, who her dad is, and, and, you know, we've heard those rumors before, might be a little bit different coming from a family member. That's pretty shocking. I think it's shocking when uh, Mrs. Longworth talks about her cousin, uh, Theodore Robinson, and his dalliances with prostitutes. I mean, there, there's some stuff on there that cuts pretty close, including, you know, questions about Franklin and Eleanor's relationship and how much there was a love between the, those two people who are, you know, I mean, as important in American history as Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and then there's smaller things too that are, you know, not shocking, but I suppose um, eye-opening about the, the, the family and the politics of the time. I mean, there's some wonderful stories about New York City politics. That you know, if you if you're interested to to learn more about how Republican machines worked during TR's time, there's some great stuff there as well, and and that's as scandalous as anything else. Great, um, and actually, do, do any of our in-person uh, attendees have any questions? No. All right. Um, don't. I don't want to forget you guys either. So <laughs> I can't feel, see anyone. I'm sorry. Well, we, we have we have a small but dedicated uh, group here. Um, and uh, let's see, any other uh, questions? Well, the, one, the one thing I would just say too um, is that if anyone does want to pick up a book, there's a discount code that I think I passed on to you guys. I hope I did. Um, if I haven't, I'll send an email out tonight and pass that on, but there's a 25% off discount until I think June or July. So uh, it should come in at around 20 bucks a book uh, and, and save you some money. All right, I will, um, that would be great, Michael. I will, um, if you can send it to me, I'll make sure I get it out to the entire list of everyone who has registered for, for this evening. Um, let's see. Oh, Stacy is also wondering what you're working on now. Oh, okay. So I'd be happy to talk to you about that because I'm currently in the throes of it. And, and uh, I haven't gotten sick of Theodore Roosevelt yet. Um, I wonder, will I ever get <laughs> sick of this? But um, so I'm working on a book about uh, TR's presidency because strangely enough, I think actually there's there's less on TR's presidency than there is on the Rough Riders or, you know, the explorations in, in, in you know, the post-presidential years. So I want to write about who really pulled the strings in the White House. And there, there's a famous picture at the end of TR's presidency of his so-called tennis cabinet. And I've gone through that and I've identified all the people, helped the Library of Congress identify all the people. And and from that, I decided I want to write about those people. And it turns out so far, about a year into this project, that you know they were really doing some amazing things that we often credit TR for. And I think you know rightly so because he's the chief executive. But a lot of these ideas and the operational uh, nature of the administrative state was was done by these completely overlooked figures in American history, and they have really exciting stories to tell. 
That sounds fascinating. And of course, uh, here at the TR inaugural site where his presidency started, it's something we're always interested in. So I can't wait to hear more about that. Um, let's see, Tom has a, a question. In Thomas Mallon's historical novel, Watergate, Alice, Ro Long Alice Roosevelt Longworth and her newspaper columnist cousins, the Alsops, come across as very snarky. Um, is that accurate from what you've seen? Wonderful question. And yes, it does. Uh, so excitingly, uh, um, Alice talks about a party that Joe Alsop, her uh, cousin, uh, I think cousin, I guess that's the relationship uh, that they that they had. And Joe Alsop had a party for her and uh, it was her birthday party. I think it was a zero ending year. And she tells quite a few stories and she tries to convince Mary and Herman Hagedorn to have her back with Joe Alsop to give a proper tell-all. Now that never happened, but she said, I think something along the lines in, in the recordings that it would be a terrible, you know, a terrible uh, expose about, you know, what, what's really, you know, what are the really naughty stories that, uh, that, that need to be told? Um, yeah, I also talked to uh, some family members of the Alsops because they get mentioned in the tapes as well. And um, they, they were really grateful. Uh, Elizabeth Winthrop, for example, um, is mentioned in the tape. She's uh, the, the daughter of one of the Alsops, Joe Alsop, I believe. Uh, and uh, she's mentioned on the tape and she had never known that her, uh, her aunt, uh, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, thought so highly of her. But apparently she was really good at doing uh, mimicking people and she mimicked Alice Longworth. And, uh, and she was always remembered for that in, in her eyes. And when she heard the recording, she was really taken aback. So there's some, there's some really deep dives you can do here with, um, with, with these families that are deeply connected. I mean, whether you talk about the Alsops who were of course connected with the Washington Post or, uh, or, or others, it's uh, the stories, uh, they, they really trickle out of these recordings. Excellent. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned that several family members, and I think you said uh, Alice in particular, were, were talking in the, uh, the recordings about how they thought uh, kind of World War I might have played out differently had TR been president or the, um, could you talk a little bit more about that or did I get that right? Yeah, you did. So, I, I mean, that that is something that comes up in, two or three of the recordings, particularly from friends that were politically involved. Um, William Chadbourne is one of them. He was um, uh, one of uh, LaGuardia's kind of chief strategists in New York City. And, you know, th their belief was, was that if Roosevelt had been president and he had won 1912, then the likelihood of America entering the war would have been, you know, it would have been more likely that the U.S. would have entered either after the Belgian atrocities in 1914, or it would have been after the Lusitania. But either way, it would have been a lot sooner. And even if the involvement only in, you know, didn't involve a, a ground invasion of American forces, it would have, it would have changed the dynamics of the war to such an extent that it would have ended before 1918 and thus before the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. So uh, you know, there's a lot, I, I think the the communist. Um, scare of the 1950s is weighing on a lot of uh, these testimonies. And because most of the participants can think back to World War I, and they, they recognize it as a formative, as formative a part of their life as World War II was, uh, they, you know, they tether those two wars together as being sort of um, cause and effect, if you will. So Roosevelt changing the dynamics of that earlier history would have naturally changed the the outcome of World War II and uh, and certainly, you know, on and on and on. Interesting, kind of, uh, you know, choose your own ending kind of thing. Yeah, or what do they say? Um, they call it the butterfly effect, isn't it? If you change something in one time and it right. yep. reverberates through another time, I think that's what they were, they were trying to say. I mean, they say it about other things too, about if Roosevelt had been president and Wilson hadn't been, you know, would we, you know, would we, I think there's, there's a sense that there would have been a, a more progressive domestic scene as well. Right. All right. Are there any other questions either from our in-person audience or online? Um, 
All right. Well, oh, wait, there's another question. Uh, Rachel wants to know, how is it doing work in the field of oral history, since I don't think that's your historical background? Well, it was a learning curve. That's a really good question, actually. Yeah, it was a learning curve. Um, I've got a really good friend of mine who, who does work on oral histories, and he's been a, a real crutch to, you know, to think about how I structure the book and how I, you know, make sure that I understand the the role of the participant and the interviewer. And uh, I tried to get into, you know, the, the history of oral history, which really does have its start in the 40s and 50s. And that kind of allowed me to see how revolutionary Herman Hagedorn's work was. I mean, it's not, it's not my background. I don't do a lot of interviews, but you know what? It, it has made me um, feel like the value of oral history. I think particularly nowadays as well, I share some of those same fears that Alan Nevins had about telecommunications. In this case, you know, telecommunications is Twitter and social media and, you know, and how do we capture uh, what's really going on in our in our day and age and sometimes just sitting down with someone and talking to them about you know what mattered most to them or what their perspective was allows us to see it in a way that's clearer than you know dissecting 2000 tweets or you know in the case of telephone calls back in the 50s that you couldn't retrieve um, so yeah I, it's been a real learning curve to figure it out and in some ways I'd love to do more of it but uh, sadly, most of the historical characters that I want to talk to are long since dead, and uh, and and I've been denied that that opportunity. But yeah, that's a great question. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'm just seeing if there are any final questions for Dr. Colinane. I don't see any. Uh, again, I want to thank you so much for, for being here. I have to confess um, ever, to everyone, you know, uh, Michael sent me his uh, PowerPoint beforehand, uh, kind of gave me a preview and I was just, I was telling all my, you know, historian friends like, oh my goodness, it's the, you know, geeky research nerd kind of thing that I love and don't get a chance to do very often. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, live vicariously through your research. Um, I appreciate you sharing it all with us. And, um, you know, if you are ever in Buffalo, we would love to give you a uh, tour of the inaugural site and uh, show you where his presidency began. So. Um, well, I'm embarrassed to say that this, this, the inaugural site is one of the places I haven't been to. And I, Cannot wait to take you up on your offer. The pandemic is just about over, fingers crossed, right? So hopefully soon. I'm really, really looking forward to meeting everyone there. Well, we would be delighted to have you here. Um, and uh, so I think that that will conclude our evening. Um, we have a uh, thank you showing up in the uh, chat box. Oh, wait, wait, do I see one more Q&A? Uh, oh, Stacy, thank you. Uh, Stacy was just thanking us um, and saying what a great talk it was. Uh, so, um, all right. Thanks again, everyone. And oh, actually, I should also mention, if you don't mind, just one second. Our our next speaker night is scheduled for Tuesday, April twenty sixth. It is going to be online only, and we are going to be uh, welcoming Dr. Tara Kathleen Kelly to our speaker night. She wrote a book, I think it's a couple of years ago, called The Hunter Elite, Manly Sport, Hunting Narratives, and the Ameri and American Conservation, 1880 to 1925. The title of her talk is going to be Making the Case for Conservation, Roosevelt, the Media, and the Battle for Public Support. So that's next month's speaker night, uh, again, online, sponsored by, the, by us here at the TR site. And, um, we hope to see people there or joining us online. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for being here this evening. Thank you, Dr. Colony. Thanks, everyone.